I wouldn't do the in-round of introduction because we're very short on time. We have only 45 minutes. Everyone knows who Dr. Tharoor is or they have heard of Dr. Tharoor. So there is no need for a formal introduction. So uh, Dr. T, I'm just jumping into the first question that we have. Then after that, we'll open the floor up for questions. Uh, okay. So just um, given your, you know, given your past as a diplomat and now in the parliament and uh, before as uh, in your stint as a minister, how much do you think your uh, your background in diplomacy has helped in terms of governance as a minister oh, and the parliamentary committees? Parliamentary committee probably has helped. Actually, when you say that, you suddenly open up a new answer because I was going to say, I don't think it's helped at all until I realized, yes, in chairing a committee, and I've now chaired two committees, having to deal with people with diverse points of view and, and, and of course, politically, in a politically polarized environment that becomes a challenge. In the committees, one can use a certain amount, a certain amount of conciliatory, accommodative skills that come with diplomacy. But outside the committee business, in politics, the diplomatic style is not only not relevant, it's very often an actual disadvantage. You know, just recently, for example, I, I chaired a parliamentary committee tour went to a state ruled by an opposition party, opposition to us, and, um, and uh, you know, made appropriate noises about, it's, and now I'm chairing the IT committee, so about their uh, initiatives in the IT field, and got a huge broadside, a rather public one, from the head of the Congress party in the state who's busy trying to overthrow uh, the ruling party there. So it's a kind of thing where what comes naturally diplomatically may not be seen as the natural thing to do politically. In politics, uh, very often one does take very, very strong uh, stands um, that are intended, frankly, to uh, not so much to make peace between irreconcilable positions, but rather to double down on one's own position. Whereas in diplomacy, and particularly at the United Nations, where my role was very often coming between two contending parties, my instincts and my practice were always to try and find common ground rather than uh, to stand very strongly on one side of an issue. And that therefore is not what politics is about. Politics, sadly or otherwise, and you can debate this till we're blue in the face, politics sadly is no longer about the search for common ground. It is very much about trying to push one's particular point of view and when you look at that, um, diplomacy is not very good training for it. Okay. Uh, but I mean, in terms of, even when you were the MEA minister, uh, briefly. And uh, there, yes, I'm sorry, you're right. Well, you know, I'm looking back now over a dozen years in Indian politics, so perhaps my ex recent experiences are coloring me too much. In MEA, it was incredibly useful, obviously. First of all, I, I knew the world that I was interacting with, and that's a world where I, I in many cases, had very good connections. I became minister uh, just a couple of years after leaving the UN. So starting with the then the new Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, uh, uh, all the way to many foreign ministers and so on, I did have good connections in my UN days. And then I did have the advantage that in my UN time, I'd, I'd been, become rather fluent in French. And a lot of um, our relations with Francophone countries, particularly Francophone African countries, many European countries, including France itself, the uh, diplomats are effortlessly bilingual. But when it comes to Africa, many of the, uh, uh, the African foreign ministers I was dealing with had French and no other foreign language. And um, there were at least two or three occasions uh, where I was accompanied by an entire Indian delegation, none of whom spoke French. And it was an absolute blessing to be able to speak to these people in their language. And then I played interpreter for my colleagues because they were able to warm much more to us when they heard us, heard our side speaking directly to them in terms they could relate to and understand. And so these are things that were wonderful. It lasted a very short while though. I was in the ministry only for a year or slightly less than a year. So um, it, it was in some ways for me, um, an unfulfilled opportunity, but during the time that I did it, yes, that was one, one thing that I found incredibly useful. And a lot of and the people visiting us and a lot of the countries that I visited were places where 
I could open doors perhaps more easily than somebody else from a classic Indian political background would have been able to. So, Nogati, we had Professor Harsh Pant coming and speaking about the foreign relations with our neighbors last week. And uh -huh. just uh, building on to that, given India's current situation with our immediate neighbors, how do you think we can you know, use diplomacy as a tool for good governance? Look, this is a very vast subject because obviously uh, mm -hmm. our neighbors are, are in many ways, um, shall we say, having rather complicated relations with us. We all know about the tensions with Pakistan, <coughs> which are compounded by the fact that the Pakistanis have really got the upper hand over us now in Taliban rule of Afghanistan, and they're benefiting from a huge Chinese investment in China's single largest project in the Belt and Road Initiative, which is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. At the same time, the Chinese are pushing us on the line of actual control across the Himalayas. Uh, the Putinese are getting warmer and friendlier to the Chinese than ever before. Uh, Nepal has already become um, a friend of China's in ways that they never were a few years ago, including permitting China to build a number of significant infrastructure projects in northern Nepal along the border with China. In the south, uh, Maldives was, 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 was really on bad terms with us, but fortunately, a change of government there meant that we now once again have a government that's reasonably well disposed towards us. Sri Lanka, it's a complicated relationship, made all the more complicated by the fact that again, China has come in with very heavy investments uh, into, that, into that country. So given all of this, we are facing a whole series of challenges. Bangladesh seems to be the only totally positive picture at the moment, a relationship which is going as well as can be expected. Um, but literally with every one of our other neighbors, Things are not quite where we would ideally have liked them to be. Um, and as I say, in the, in the Maldives, the memory of, of strained relations of advertisements in the newspapers from Maldivian hotels saying Indian passport holders need not apply when they advertise jobs uh, is so fresh that I would still say Maldives, we, we, have, we have to really reestablish a proper relationship. Given all of this, Angelica, we are facing huge, huge challenges. My stand on our relationship with our neighbors has always been that as by far the biggest country, you know, we, we all sat around a table, uh, except for China, obviously. Well, India would account for um, about 70% of the combined population, about 80% of the combined GDP. So we really have to behave uh, with greater magnanimity than we have recently done in some cases. And I think uh, there is no shame at all in what one might call asymmetrical relationships. That is a, a relationship in which we give more than we take. So I'm going to open the floor up for questions. Anyone wants to go ahead right now and ask? Okay, uh, Neelam. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have a question. You have been a successful diplomat in a successful, uh, you know, you have also handled the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. You know, out of the two roles, which role you enjoyed the most? And uh, that's the first question. And second, I have a small question that considering there are now two power sources coming up in the world, China and US, how do you see the whole shift going on? And what should be India position in this case? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, well, on, on the question of which role I enjoy more, um, I think if I said that I preferred in many ways the very familiar environment of international diplomacy having done it for 29 years, uh, then I would be doing a disservice to my voters because that's where my duty lies uh, in politics. Your first duty is to those who have entrusted you with their confidence to represent them in parliament and on the national stage. Um, I, I would say that therefore to me, um, my first commitment very much is to my voters, but purely in terms of being comfortable with the familiar, obviously that was a world I operated in literally everywhere. I was posted by the UN in Southeast Asia, in Geneva, in New York. Uh, I, I, I handled the war and civil war in Yugoslavia. I dealt with crises on pretty much every continent. Uh, I traveled with the Secretary General to meet world leaders around, obviously there was a certain uh, comfort level with that experience, which is somewhat different 
from the uh, somewhat, shall we say, uh, more challenging demands of actually uh, getting involved in retail politics, especially if you haven't grown up with it as I haven't. I don't come from a political family. Uh, I didn't come into politics as an inheritance or as something I've done since my student days, as is the case of many in my state. I actually came to it after having had a full career somewhere else. And that's an unusual thing. There are very, very few in Indian politics like that. Those few you can count uh, who have that kind of background have come usually from the Indian bureaucracy into, into politics. And they're very familiar with India, with the districts, with villages, but even with politics having been at the wrong end of, of politics. Whereas in my case, my career was entirely abroad. And therefore, it's been very much learning on the job, which is always tougher. But certainly my duty uh, and therefore my consciousness of responsibility is very much first and foremost with my voters and, and, and with therefore the uh, political duties that I have. Secondly, when you ask about, um, when you ask about uh, uh, the global situation and the US's role, the US, as you know, is, is, has been in retreat for some time. They have been dramatically reducing their troops in not just Afghanistan, which we've all read about in recent months, but before that, from Syria, from Libya, from Iraq. Um, the US uh, clearly has lost the appetite it used to have for extending itself around the world. Indeed, its troops uh, abroad are principally in countries where there has been literally no military action for 50, 60 years. Countries like Germany, Japan, Korea, legacies of wars that ended decades ago. Uh, and therefore, um, for us now to expect the Americans to be, a, how can I put it, um, a, a take an active interest in the work of, um, of, of, of um, all sorts of, um, take an active interest in the, in, in, in the, in the work of, um, of all regions of the world with which they don't feel a direct concern is I think uh, therefore naive. So, at the same time, they do see a competition that they're in with uh, China. And because they see that they're in that competition, uh, they're looking around for partners and India is a partner. We're not an ally in that we don't commit ourselves to always being on America's side. We don't commit ourselves, for example, to fighting side by side in a military conflict and so on. But we are a partner in the Quad and the Quad particularly is focused on the maritime uh, areas of the Indo-Pacific, that is the Indian Ocean, South China Sea, and there, India, Japan, Australia, and the US will cooperate together, um, creating, if you like, a different kind of um, ethos in that area. But when it comes to actual military cooperation, we're not there. The Americans have just concluded something with the, um, with the um, uh, Australians and the UK. The UK is not even a member of the Quad, but India and Japan are not part of it. And tomorrow, if we were caught up in a really bad conflict with China and Pakistan uh, on our borders, I would not expect the Americans to put any boots on the ground to help us because uh, you know, their interest is in where their, uh, shall we say, their geopolitical vision is at stake. And they see the Indo-Pacific as a theater of operations, particularly in the area of Southeast Asia and East Asia. Whereas for India, um, that's fine, that's interesting, but it's not our principal area of, uh, of geopolitical challenge, which is directly on land and on our own borders. Okay, uh, I wanted to talk about South China Sea, but let's not get there, but sorry, I'm coming to you for your question. <laughs> um, you know what, um, like now I wanna ask about South China, South China Sea, but I am gonna, I actually, wanted to talk more about your role with the United Nations. And um, particularly, I feel like I'm um, just, I remember there being like reading about a lot of criticism about UN's role during the Rwandan genocide, but we do not see that sort of like criticism lately when it comes to the UN. And I just wanted to know what you think about where um, the United Nations is going and is it still as relevant as it used to be? I know that's a very yeah, I, I was very privileged to have served the United Nations during its peak relevance. If you really had to see a period uh, when I was first working for the UN High Commissioner for Refugees uh, from 78 to 89, and those were wonderful years of refugee action where unfortunately the Cold War was still raging, there was still civil wars around the world, refugees were fleeing, 
and I got involved in many of them, particularly the Vietnamese boat people crisis. And I headed the UN office in Singapore, all the refugees were being rescued on the high seas and brought into the port. Uh, so that was a great time. And then from 91, when the Cold War ended, suddenly a whole amount of peacekeeping became possible. And I was in the peacekeeping department, literally growing with it, rising with it. And, and then finally, Kofi Annan really placed the UN on the world map, on the public consciousness. And he, uh, in many ways, embodied the hopes and aspirations of greater multilateral cooperation, which probably got dashed with the Iraq war in 2003. But for those first seven years of his term, it was absolutely the peak relevance of the UN. We, we got a lot of new ideas on the agenda, ranging from sustainable development to the right of intervention, to, uh, to, to the responsibility to protect the whole sorts of concepts that the world was waking up to that came out of us in Kofi Annan's immediate team. And I was so privileged to be part of his, uh, his, his small inner circle doing all this work. So I was very lucky. I would say the UN of today is a long way short of, of where uh, any of us would like to be in the sense that um, my gut instinct about the UN remains that it's an indispensable organization. It's the only organization that brings all countries in the world together, not to battle their own interests, but rather to serve our common interests, the interests of our humanity. But nonetheless, uh, in geopolitics now, if you look at the big ticket crises around the world, the UN seems sadly largely irrelevant. It is essentially absent from the fray for all practical purposes in any of the big issues bedeviling the Middle East. And today in Afghanistan, there are only three things it can do. It can provide humanitarian relief, which is something the Taliban are willing to accept uh, and that it's doing. Uh, it can monitor human rights, but it can't do anything about human rights in a, uh, in a, in a, in a country where they're very busy shooting anybody whom they accuse of collaborating and chopping off the hands of women who wear nail polish and, and, uh, and, and that sort of really barbaric uh, uh, punishments. Uh, human rights is almost a, a rhetorical term. Uh, UN can use it, but it doesn't have any direct impact on the ground. Uh, and the third thing they might have been able to do had the war gone differently uh, would have been to try and interpose a peacekeeping operation and create a broad-based transitional government between the outgoing Ashraf Ghani government and the incoming Taliban, a broad-based government on both sides and so on. But the UN wasn't in on the act early enough. It wasn't brought in by the world powers early enough. And as we all know, uh, the government fell so quickly and Ashraf Ghani fell, uh, fled so quickly and the Taliban took over. There was no room for any other peacekeeping force or the creation of any broad-based government. It was essentially a capitulation of what had been built up over 20 years in, in 20 days. And in those circumstances, there is a not a lot that we can say about what the UN can do. So at the stage, I would have to admit that the UN as a concept is indispensable. The UN right now as an actor in actually making a difference in a number of places, I would say is not actually doing all that. I just wanted to follow up slightly. I don't want to take mm -hmm. up other, someone else's time, but um, so is that the state with every sort of multilateral project at this point? Like, because I'm thinking of, um, say, the way uh, Chinese investment is at par or even more at this point than the investment that World Bank puts in or IMF puts in in a lot of countries. I was wondering what is the state of multilateralism also overall, or is it just like, Oh. Well, it's had its ups and downs, Bansuri. It's had its ups and downs because, you know, with multilateralism, um, you had last year Donald Trump announcing the American withdrawal from the WHO. That was a pretty bad blow for multilateralism. You had the WHO itself being blamed for having let the Chinese off the hook on the initial spread of the virus. That was a blow for multilateralism. You saw uh, there's been zero progress in Security Council reform. That's a blow for multilateralism and so on. So you can say there are a lot of challenges that have been resolved in the post-COVID world. But it can be revived. And I think uh, the re-election of Antonio Guterres, uh, which has now been confirmed, and it's a formality now, he, um, he will have the moral authority uh, to be able to try and change that story around. One of the things I would hope he would do is when COVID is well and truly beaten, he should convene a, a post-COVID summit of all the world leaders saying, here's our opportunity to learn what didn't we do right? What did we do wrong? 
where were we lacking in terms of institutions and procedures to address the COVID menace? What do we need to do for the next big pandemic? And therefore, five, what are the reforms of the UN system that you are able to agree upon? And that, I think, is what we need to do. Um, and, and to be very honest, I hope he will do it. I, you know, I'm not there. Uh, uh, all I can say is, to my mind, that would be the right thing for him. Uh, Zara, I was going to you. Good evening, sir. Good evening, so, hi, Zara. Based on your uh, experience as a diplomat, how do you view the Namaste Trump event, not as a congressman, but uh, from the prism of uh, does it set an example and a precedence is set and what are the repercussions of it beyond just the party that won there and the party that lost? How do you see it? I'm, I'm sorry, I had an urgent message coming in even while you were talking. Would you repeat that briefly? My apologies. Yeah, she how was, do you... How do you view the Namaste Trump event in terms of diplomatic ties and if a precedence that is bad has been set, were there any uh, achievements out of it, anything good that came out in your view? No, I, I think it, it was a gamble by the Indian government that Trump would be re-elected and that uh, keeping him happy would be good for, because he's, he was seen, I think, by everybody as a very mercurial figure, somebody very temperamental, somebody likely to be swayed by his personal likes and dislikes. Uh, and therefore, uh, for Mr. Modi to put it bluntly to suck up to him was seen as, as the right thing to do. I think it was a, a gamble that misfired because um, first of all, uh, uh, Mr. Trump didn't last very much longer. Secondly, uh, the Namaste Trump event may actually have contributed to, um, to a, a spike in COVID because it was at a time when, if at all, Mr. Modi was going to go for a lockdown, he should have started by then. But he kept everything open and tried to convey normalcy for two main reasons. One was Namaste Trump, and the other was um, trying to topple the Congress government in Madhya Pradesh, which was a, clearly a bigger priority for Mr. Modi than preventing COVID. So in these circumstances, uh, I don't see much good in Namaste Trump. It was earlier in Haudi Modi that he had said, uh, Ab ki baad, Trump Sarkar, which was, of course, a major gaffe, which he'll be living down, because obviously nobody writing the briefing notes for President Biden and Kamala Harris has forgotten to remind them that Modi is the man who said that. So he's starting off, as it were, on the back foot when he has these meetings this week with these uh, American leaders. So on the whole, my, my view is, you know, let's by all means have warm public relationships with uh, foreign leaders, but let's not personalize it uh, effusively. And above all, let's not get involved in any other country's domestic politics and imply we have favorites. I think that's always unwise. In democracies, the tradition is supposed to be that you should be able to work with anybody uh, who comes to power because it's not your business who comes to power. It's that of the voters of the country that you have a relationship with. And so our relationship is with the United States. It's not with Republicans or Democrats, it's certainly not with Mr. Trump or his daughter uh, or any, anyone else. I mean, it really is a relationship that is meant to be country to country, people to people, government to government. And we should have uh, warmly welcomed the president as we warmly welcomed hundreds of presidents and prime ministers in the last 75 years. But uh, going overboard with this um, Howdy Modi on the one hand and Namaste Trump is in my view, a most unfortunate way of taking politics forward and international politics forward. It doesn't work. And I think it's hurt us slightly. Um, uh, Ramya, we can answer questions. Oh God, we have so many questions. Uh, yeah. Hi, very uh, good evening. I'll, yeah, I'm keeping my video off because my internet connection is weak. Um, good evening, Dr. Tharoor. I wanted to know um, your thoughts on Pegasus role, um, given uh, not only as a as a leader in public life, but maybe uh, uh, maybe uh, I guess uh, as as a victim of uh, some kind of this kind of uh, thing. Given you are also member of parliamentary committee on uh, IT. Uh, so your thoughts on that and uh, second would be okay Ramya that's it just one question Ramya sorry <laughs> okay okay yeah, yeah. so Ramya uh, my, my short answer is that I think it's a very very serious issue and I think the government's behavior has demonstrated that they really have something to hide uh, first of all um, it's an issue that um, when it first came up two years ago targeting human rights activists um, the BJP members of the committee tried to prevent a discussion Matters even came after two and a half hour argument, it came to a vote 
we were able to get equal number of people voting for and against the discussion. And I was able to use my casting vote to permit a discussion. When that discussion happened, the government uh, witnesses refused to confirm or deny anything. Uh, and, and though we heard from, we heard test testimony from the, from the victims of the Pegasus hack in 2019, we were not able to do anything for them or about it. Two years later, we got into a position where, very frankly, um, we were in a position where um, uh, the government and the BJP were simply determined that this issue would not be had, would not have any light cast on it. When we raised it in Parliament, the BJP showed up in large numbers. Um, there were we had nineteen people. We had nineteen people in the room. Ten BJP, nine non-BJP. Uh, they called two or three neutrals and told them not to attend. I know this from the neutrals themselves directly. Uh, and because everyone is anxious not to antagonize the ruling party at the center, uh, those uh, MPs did not attend. Uh, and the 10 who had come from the BGP refused to sign the attendance register, so we would not have a quorum and we couldn't discuss the issue. They also managed to persuade, not persuade, to instruct the three secretaries of the relevant departments, that is the Home Ministry, the IT Ministry, and the Telecoms Ministry, uh, to find last minute excuses not to show up for a meeting on, to which they had been summoned way, way before. So uh, they very, very much are behaving like people who have something to hide. And that's, I think, uh, a, a damning indictment of where our country stands on, on Pegasus. What is Pegasus? Pegasus is a software that essentially sits on your phone and clones it, gets, gets all the information that the seeker wants out of your phone, allows them essentially to peer into your phone whenever, any time of the day or night. And that is illegal in India. So when the government takes shelter behind saying national security and so on, that is utter BS, number one, because the law is very clear. There are interceptions permissible under national security. They have to be authorized in very strict laid down procedures under the law. And those procedures run out in a short period of time, uh, two months renewable uh, uh, for three. And at the same time, they have to be reviewed by another committee. So there's a very strict set of procedures, but they are only authorized on very specific grounds permitted by law, which all relate to national sovereignty, national security, the prevention of the commission of a serious crime, that sort of thing. Now, there's also a provision, two provisions, sections 43 and 66 of the IT Act, which specifically state that you cannot actually implant a virus on any computer device, computer resource, uh, or computer network. So uh, that's punishable, by the way, by a three lakh fine and five years in jail, or maybe a five lakh fine and three years in jail. I can't remember that. But the problem is, it's completely illegal to do something like Pegasus, even on the grounds of national security. Uh, on top of that, and the second, uh, third most important consideration here, is that if you look at the target list, these are not people who represent any threat to national security. Prashant Kishore managing Mamta Banerjee's campaign during a Bengal election is not a threat to national security. It may be a threat to the, to, to the peaceful sleep of some BJP political operatives, but it's not a threat to national sovereignty, integrity, or security. Um, the same with uh, Mamta Banerjee's nephew, Abhishek, the same with his aides. All these people were proven because their phones were submitted for forensic analysis. They were proven to have had Pegasus on their phones. Now, in these circumstances, I think it's very clear that all we need to say is uh, this is something where really um, uh, transgression has occurred. Governments have misused uh, software meant for national security for the purposes of the narrow partisan political advantage of the ruling party, and they have spent taxpayers' money to do so. That is truly potentially criminal. And that's why I and many others have called for a Supreme Court monitored investigation into this. So far, we don't have one, but at least the Supreme Court is hearing it. There's talk of a technical committee, whether a technical committee would be able to investigate. I don't know, but we'll have to see how it works in practice. Dr. T, just adding on to that question, um, even though it's sold by a private company, is there any repercussions to India's relationship with the Israel government? No, apparently not. See, Israel and India have very close relationships on a number of security aspects, counterintelligence, counterterrorism, intelligence sharing, and all of that stuff. So my view on that is that that's going to continue because it's in the larger national interest of each country. 
What we don't know is whether India was one of the countries where the operations of Pegasus were stopped by the Israelis because of alleged misuse. And we'll never know that at a time when we don't even officially know it was used uh, by the government of India. How can we know whether it was stopped by the Israeli government? So as of now, the short answer is I haven't got a clue. My guess is it will not affect the relationship. Uh, ben Jokun, go to your question. Thank you. Um, uh, to focus our attention inward, uh, what do you think has been the major gaps in our diplomacy in terms of uh, bringing a resolution to Kashmir? Uh, not only in terms of how we're engaging with uh, Pakistan and China over it, but also how we're engaging uh, with the Kashmiri leadership. And uh, what the, I mean, uh, what kind of movement do you see in the in the international community uh, that might uh, that might put pressure on uh, on India to be able to bring a resolution uh, to the conflict to the Kashmir conflict? Vinjal, mm -hmm. is that what you mean? Yeah. So, so the fact yes, is that yes. if you if you if you look at the UN, uh, the UN got massively involved at the time of, of, of the initial troubles in 47, 48. Because India went to, to Kashmir and said, look, the Pakistanis have invaded our sovereign territory, a state that has acceded to the Indian Union, and the UN needs to get involved. Uh, many uh, fear that that may not have served our best interest because the UN's involvement brought an international eye to bear on what we should really have, according to them, seen as our own business. Uh, then you can fast forward to 72, when the similar accord at the end of the Indo-Pak War of 71 uh, said that the two countries would solve the problem of Kashmir bilaterally and there would be no uh, international involvement whatsoever. Uh, though Pakistan signed that accord, it's really tried very hard to get the UN active in this. And um, to the UN's credit and the credit of big powers on the Security Council, many have said, look, until both sides really want international mediation or international peacemaking or international involvement, there's not much point in us talking about it or doing anything about it. That was the stand for a good 25, 30 years. But um, in recent times, and I mean, particularly since the abolition of Article 370, Pakistan has been able once again to bring the issue up front. Um, and there has been a discussion in the Security Council uh, for the first time in, in decades. And that is not something that most of us in India would consider a healthy development. Because either Kashmir is a you know, inalienable part of our sovereign territory, or it's a territory under dispute. Uh, we took it uh, initially to the UN as a disputed territory, but now that we have uh, established a different situation, then we don't particularly want other countries talking about it. As of now, it's remained at the level of talk, but many would say the fact that talking happened at all is itself disturbing. Just yesterday or day before, there was a rather heated two and a half hour debate in the British House of Commons. Uh, about Kashmir and alleged Indian human rights abuses there and so on. So the international lens has been uh, focused on Kashmir again after a very long time, and that's not particularly good. So in my own view, it's in our interest to resolve the matter once and for all. And that has two components. The first is internal and the second is external, whether we like it or not. The internal is we need to make sure that we can, I think, rapidly resume normal political activity in Kashmir, let the Kashmiri people choose their own political representatives, have an active assembly again, and do so ideally as a normal state. I was in Kashmir quite recently and a Kashmiri politician said to me, it was a private conversation, so I won't name him, but he said to me something that I, I was very struck by. He said, when we talk about statehood, we want to be a normal state like Kerala, not a state like Delhi. Uh, in other words, we don't want any extra special powers for the central government. We want to be allowed to run our own affairs, but within the Indian constitution as an Indian state, like any other Indian state, which I must say, I like the sound of that. Uh, that means I think that we should definitely start, for example, moving away back from union territory status to statehood, we should have a, a, a election, so legislative assembly. Uh, we should uh, unban whoever has been banned, release whoever is detained. Let them all come out and, and seek the views of the public. I think the Kashmiri public are tired of militancy, violence, uh, shuttered shops and closed businesses. They want normal life. They want to make money to educate their children, to feed their families, all the things that everybody else wants. 
why should they feel that they're denied that? Uh, but at the same time, as I said, there is an external dimension. The external dimension is Pakistan and Pakistan's financing and encouragement of militancy uh, in, in Kashmir. Now, for this, we need to do two things. On the one hand, we need to toughen and strengthen our border controls to ensure that they're not as porous as they've sometimes turned out to be, to ensure we can prevent infiltration into our part of Kashmir. And at the same time, we need to move very, very sensibly on the international diplomacy front. Dr. Manmohan Singh, when he was prime minister, had made a lot of headway with uh, then President Musharraf to try and create a, a sort of situation in which President Musharraf um, was willing to talk about solutions that fell way short of any territory having to be surrendered or any sovereignty lost. If we've been able to convert the line of control into an actual permanent border, for example, if we've been able to create uh, consultative arrangements between the two halves of Kashmir, even a joint forum, uh, if you want, you can even call it a joint assembly so that they can keep some of their historic links uh, alive and we can gradually soften borders. It would have been a terrific thing for the people of both countries and we could have moved on from the unproductive and needless uh, waste of resources in uh, uh, maintaining and sustaining bitter hostility with each other. So for all of these reasons, my view uh, remains, and, 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 and you know, I know some uh, in the government will think I'm being too much of a peacenik. Um, I, I just think that that's the, that's the best way forward. And then once that's happened, you won't have to worry about discussions in the UN or anywhere else because the problem will be over. Thanks, Minja. Thank you. First of all, it's so nice to see you, sir, after a really, really long time, even though it's virtually. Um, my question is that, uh, so we've seen that local governments, they receive uh, very strong demands uh, from the UN when it comes to implementing the Sustainable Development Goals. And a lot of times the fulfillment of the same has not been possible due to inadequate resources. So do you think that... Uh, parallel diplomacy could be a way to go about? And what do you think could be the scope or potential of parallel diplomacy, especially in India? Hmm. Well, our sustainable development goals are frankly goals that governments set themselves, right? So these are not goals that anybody imposes on anybody else or can help anyone else to fulfill. Um, in principle, a government says, this is what I think we can do. Um, and, and, uh, the UN records their own intentions and then eventually will report on whether they've been able to do what they said they could do. That's, that's essentially what the SDGs are. And therefore, um, outsiders coming in to tell governments what to do doesn't really work. Now, para diplomacy, we all know, is international relations, which are conducted by, uh, in our case, state governments, in other countries' cases, regional governments, subnational governments. Um, these are what para diplomacy. So I don't know if you really meant that. Should a state have a diplomatic relationship with another country? There you're venturing into, into territory which goes beyond the SDGs. Because, for example, if a state says that in order to fulfill the SDGs, I need more financial assistance than the central government is giving me, therefore I want to go to a neighboring country and get that. That has very serious political and diplomatic implications on which the central government is bound to have a view. And under our constitution, foreign affairs is actually not on the concurrent list, it's purely on the central list. So only the central government can conduct foreign relations. Now we have been tolerant of certain kinds of relationships, chief ministers of states going to foreign countries uh, and, and selling their state as it were and so on. Uh, I've even written an article on this, I, I forgot who I was it for ORF, I think some, some time ago. Uh, but the truth is that um, as of now, uh, we don't have a situation like, say, the Canadian government permits in which you actually have um, representative offices of some of the Canadian states in foreign countries. Quebec actually has kind of ambassadors without the name ambassador, but representatives in many foreign countries. We, we don't actually permit that ourselves. Okay, uh, I had a question on follow up, but the Sakshi will go to you. Thank you, Angelica. Good evening, Dr. Tharoor. Uh, just wanted to start with a little bit of a gratitude note. Uh, 
think you would remember that you were in Pune for the Lit Fest two years ago, and you met three Teach for India students there. Um, we didn't have any books, nothing that uh, sir could sign. We just requested for a picture, and I think even till date, just those two minutes of conversation are. continuing to inspire not just the three kids but all 74 of them so never got a chance to say thank you um and um uh, moving to my question um sir i was wondering what your thoughts or uh, thoughts are on the sort of hybrid definition of public policy as it were right now with a lot of uh, public private partnerships happening like um, everyone from a vidhi to say a central square foundation is working on implementing legislation without any direct accountability check uh, so let me hear your thoughts on um, what a more accountable partnership could potentially look like no, but without taking policy, any names no no but public policy by definition Uh, is really a free for all. Uh, I have to say, thank you, Vijay. First of all, for your very kind words. Uh, gratitude is not something I'm used to in in politics. I've done an enormous number of favors, far bigger than than just a photograph or two minutes of conversation. For lots of people, I've never heard a word of thanks. Uh, they've come to you when they need you, for the most part, and they go away very quickly. And politicians learn not to expect gratitude. So, thank you for a very sweet uh, beginning to your question. But coming back to um, to what we're saying i mean you know public policy is about everything the laws the regulations the actions the funding priorities uh, that that go into a particular policy area uh, and that usually um, a government gets into so it's a free for all in the sense that everybody every entity every ngo uh, every um, um, every institution every interest group um, can lobby uh, in order to influence those laws and regulations and courses of action and funding priorities that's ultimately what every one of us in a democracy ought to be able to do so uh, if one particular center wants a particular kind of law passed there is nothing preventing another uh, civil society group from proposing a very different law and in fact i have myself i'm routinely and frequently lobbied by public policy interest groups um i i i am an opposition mp and Therefore, all I can do is raise an issue. I can't make the policy, but I can influence the discussion on the policy uh, to the extent that the ruling party is paying attention, and I do try and do that whenever I can. Thank you, Tashi. Good evening, Doctor Tharoor. Uh, of evening. course, we have uh, talked of you, uh, and we all know you. You know, as a politician and a diplomat, but there is no way that I cannot mention your literary career. i teach literature you know in delhi university uh, and therefore i have been following you know all your writings right from uh, the great indian novel right till uh, the last one uh, the battle for belonging so i just want to know so uh, how do politi- politics diplomacy and literature fit in together is that a very different and a very special you know kind of a politician uh, who writes so much and who writes so well <laughs> you very kind you know uh in our history politicians who wrote uh, actually were not that unusual of course nehru ji was your preeminent example of somebody who wrote very beautiful enduring long lasting books uh with great style and high quality and did so often in places like jail so uh, there was no incompatibility between uh his idea of uh, of of what his political duties were and is using his writing as a vehicle to advance his ideas now if you look at my books and other are 22 of them to look at even my f- few books of fiction have been vehicles for ideas my novels are novels of ideas and my non fiction is all about advancing a particular point of view in the world and i'm proud to say that doing that has come to mean for me something of tremendous tremendous importance because I don't know uh in any case anybody except for a few prime ministers who are remembered by the positions they have uh I don't think any of you can name uh, five ministers from 20 years ago so I don't think in the end of the day the things we aim for in politics power position and so on are necessarily of enduring uh, uh lasting impact they have impact when you are there but ideas and books in my mind are perennial and and I always feel that anybody uh decades from now might pick up something i've written 
And therefore, if I want to leave a lasting contribution uh, on the world, it's going to be through my thoughts and ideas more than any positions I might have attained. Now, you say that's unusual. That's true. It's more unusual than it used to be. If you look at um, uh, the cabinet, the first cabinet of independent India, I probably dare say that maybe everybody there has published at least one book. Uh, Maulana Azad wrote a memorable memoir. Ambedkar published dozens of books. Um, Neruji, of course. But today, yes, I, I, would, I would concede that it's much, much rarer for us to be able to see um, uh, politicians coming up with um, really important or, or, or worthwhile lasting works. We do have politicians are writing op-eds in the papers, and some of them put those op-eds together in a book, but we don't have enough uh, serious, original, far-reaching thinking on specific theses. And I'll be very honest with you, my uh, view of the world and my understanding of what I was writing about and reacting to way predates my involvement in politics. I, I'm really a newbie politician. I came into politics effectively in 2009, started flirting with it uh, uh, by returning to India for good in late 2008, whereas my first book was published in 1981. So looking at somebody with a long paper trail before he came into politics, and therefore I'd like to think that even if I'm now a former minister, one day I'll be a former MP, I certainly hope and intend that I'll never be a former writer. That's ultimately who I am and what I hope to be remembered by. Um, I'm being reminded that we are out of time. Um, so, sir, if there is any last thoughts you want to share before you leave us. No, one last question, perhaps, since I really okay. wanted to respond to you. Okay, Jyoti. Jyoti, go. Uh, thank you, sir, for being here. Uh, sir, my question is uh, India always wants to become a veto power in the UN. And in the decision that Corona pandemic has been taken in the Indian government, it has impacted our relations on the international level. What are your thoughts on that? Look, in the Corona pandemic, we have got a good opportunity to show people, to show the world, that we are also a responsible citizen. देश हमें हमारे देश दुनिया के लिए काम कर सकते हैं इसलिए मैंने पहले जब जनवरी फेब्रुअरी इस साल नरेंद्र मोदी जी ने हमारे वैक्सीन्स को मेरे ख्याल में 76 देश को भेज दिया मैं एक्चुअली शुरुआत में उसको मेरा समर्थन दिया क्योंकि मैं चाहता था कि भारत के बारे में लोग बोले कि देखिए ये देश दुनिया को मदद करने के लिए तैयार लेकिन मुझे उस वक्त पता नहीं था कि मोदी जी ये कर रहा था जब हमारे देश के लोगों के लिए उसने कोई भी स्टॉक ऑर्डर नहीं किया था सिर्फ 1.1 करोड़ डोज उसने दिया हमारे देश में 120 करोड़ लोग हैं क्या सोच के उसने ऐसे किया मुझे मालूम नहीं है विदेश में पब्लिसिटी मिलना अच्छी बात है लेकिन हमारे भारतवासी पहला आना चाहिए और इस इसके कारण जब हमारे सेकंड वेव वो दूसरा लहर में जो बहुत लोग के के मौत भी हो गए हम हर रोज देखते थे दिल्ली में कि लोग अस्पताल में पलंग ढूंढते थे जो नहीं मिल रहे थे ऑक्सीजन ढूंढते थे नहीं मिल रहे थे और और लोग के ध्यान हर रोज आपको आपको फोटोज देखे होंगे कितने फ्यूनरल पायर्स हर जगह में कितने लोग गरीब लोग अपने परिवार के कोविड से देहांत हुए व्यक्तियों को गंगा में उनके लाश दिखते थे ये सब देख के तो कितना दुख हमें हुआ होगा आ, मुझे भी ये सब महसूस हुआ इसलिए मैं तो सरकार को बहुत स्ट्रांगली क्रिटिसाइज किया तो अभी इस हफ्ते आपको पता है कि हमारे आरोग्य मंत्री जो है स्वास्थ्य मंत्री श्री मंसूर मांडवे उसने कहा है कि भारत दोबारा एक्सपोर्ट्स रिज्यूम कर रहे हैं और मैंने सिर्फ ये कहा कि अगर आप भारत भारतवासियों के लिए प्रोडक्शन बढ़ाया है अगर आप जो एग्जिस्टिंग फैक्ट्रीज है उसके अलावा सब लाइसेंसिंग करके दूसरे फैक्ट्रीज में एक्स्ट्रा प्रोडक्शन करने के लिए बंदोबस्त किए हैं तब देश को बताइए कि हम ये सब किए हैं इसलिए हमारे पास काफी होंगे लेकिन जब तीन महीने पहले हम सब देख चुके हैं कि क्लिनिक्स के बाहर 
क्लियर साइंस थे सॉरी आउट ऑफ वैक्सीन कम बैक टूमोरो जब हालत इतनी बुरी है कि जिस हमारे भारतवासियों जो वैक्सीन चाहते थे उनको नहीं मिल रहे थे अगर इस हालत में हम फिर पहुंचे तो मैं बिल्कुल इस पॉलिसी को समर्थन नहीं दे सकता आप पूछते हैं कि कोविड और अंतरराष्ट्रीय इमेज वैक्सीन मैत्री अंतरराष्ट्रीय इमेज के लिए ही सरकार कर रहा कर रही है लेकिन क्या ये ठीक है क्या कोई भी सरकार की प्रायोरिटी पहले अपने ही जनता होना चाहिए इसमें तो मेरे मन में कोई शक नहीं है Until you have protected and immunized everybody in India who wants to be fully vaccinated, you really should not be sending precious doses of vaccine abroad. So, in this, to my point of view, it is very clear. I am not saying that Bharat's image has changed because in the last year, the people who have heard about our country, they have seen how many thousands of our migrant workers have been forced to अपने गांव वापस चले गए क्योंकि इस सरकार लॉकडाउन के बिना सोच समझ के बिना कोई बंदोबस्त करके बिना कोई वार्निंग देके कोई भी देश में आप देखिए लॉकडाउन के लिए कम से कम एक हफ्ते नोटिस देते थे सरकार के अगले हफ्ते में हमें लॉकडाउन आने वाला है ये तो नमस्ते ट्रंप वाले वो भी नहीं कर पाए तो इसलिए जो दे, लोग देखा अच्छा नहीं था काफी नेगेटिव पब्लिसिटी मिली हमें और इस साल जो दूसरा लहर में हुआ वो भी भारत का नाम को बदनाम कर दिया तो मैं नहीं कहूंगा कि आप कोविड में भारत की इंटरनेशनल अंतरराष्ट्रीय इमेज जो है वो बढ़ गया है लेकिन अगर अगर हमारे हमारे देश में जरा शांति समाधान आ जाए कोविड इतना सीरियस नहीं है कि तीसरा लहर नहीं होगा और हम दोबारा वैक्सीनेशन रिज्यूम वैक्सीनेशन एक्सपोर्ट रिज्यूम करें और वैक्सीन मैत्री के नाम में बहुत लोगों को विदेश के लोगों को मदद दे सके तो शायद उस वक्त हम दोबारा इस विषय पे बात कर सकते हैं कि शायद भारत का इमेज बढ़ गया लेकिन अभी मैं ये बोलने के लिए तैयार नहीं हो सकता थैंक यू योर हिंदी हैज बिकम अमेजिंग आई हैव हर्ड यू स्पीक इन हिंदी फॉर सच अ लॉन्ग पीरियड ऑफ टाइम दिस मच आई कैन स्पीक बट आई टेंड नॉट टू डू मच ऑफ इट इन पब्लिक इज आई नो इट्स 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 होरेंडस फॉर वन स्पेसिफिक रीजन which is that a malayali whose other language is english can never master gender in french the rules are simpler but i have no idea why a hindi wala thinks that a bed is feminine and a table is masculine or vice versa or why a government is feminine i mean can you imagine chappan and ki chhati his sarkar is feminine I, you know it's difficult for me to understand the logic behind all of this and therefore i make mistakes in gender all the time and that's why i'm embarrassed to speak in hindi No, it's it's really good. I mean, it's really nice. And Dr. Tharoor, uh, I know we have to leave. Is there any last thoughts you want to tell no, us? No, my 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 my, us? my only last thought is to express admiration to all of you for doing this. I am actually delighted that the your group exists, and that's something which is which is very important because for a country where women uh, really uh, have have not been given proper representation in the political landscape, let's all admit that. um and where i've come from a stage where a lady politician then head of the mahila congress had to shave off the hair from her head as a mark of personal protest after being denied a party ticket she rightly felt she was entitled to after many years of service in politics in such a country the need for young women to expose themselves to political ideas political opportunities and and political networking is wonderful and i'm very pleased to applaud that um there are at the moment 79 female mps on the lok sabha that's 14% representation 26 in the rajya sabha 11% representation that's clearly not fair in a country where you are almost 50% female so my party has supported the women's reservation bill which at one point was supported by almost every party that would reserve 33% of seats in both houses but as we all know the ruling party despite having supported it in the rajya sabha at that time has never brought the bill to the lok sabha for passage and in these circumstance um so sir in these circumstances i i i must say that i can't offer you any easy way or easy path towards success in all of this but i will say that what i really want to see is um is 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 uh, more participation from women across all strata of society and uh, your own existence as a group 
issues you discuss, the interactions you have, do send a positive message uh, to your members and beyond your members. And that's one of the reasons why I think we should probably publicize this conversation. We should at least let people know that you exist and that forums like yours are there precisely to give politically minded women an opportunity to engage and, and, to, and to put a leg up. I may add one little plug for the All India Professionals Congress that I chair. Many of you are professionals. I'm disappointed that I see only one or two of you as members I recognize and know in the IPC. I hope the rest of you will seriously consider joining us because in addition to being women, you're also professionals and uh, we do provide a useful platform for you to engage with contemporary policies. That said, my very, on very best wishes sir, to you, Angelica. Thank yes, sorry. You. On, on that note, I just have to tell you that uh, Zara has been talking a lot about AIPC mm -hmm. and there has been a lot of interest from the group. So I'm uh -huh. sure a lot of them will be reaching out to Zara later after the program <laughs> to know about That's wonderful. About and and Zara, Zara is a star for us in Maharashtra. We do have chapters in 20 states. So wherever your members are from, they should seriously think of joining us. Thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. All it's the very best to you. all of you. Thank you. Jenica, thank you for the invitation. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Good luck.